min-max problems for functions of two variables. But before we get into those, let's remind ourselves of the process for a function of one variable. So here's such a function. And if I want to identify mins and maxes, my first strategy is to look at places that are possible mins or maxes. So if we look at a graph, what are some places where we could have a min or a max? Notice most of these are values that have horizontal tangents. So those are points with critical values such that f prime of c equals zero. That's our first strategy. And then this one is a place where the first derivative doesn't exist. So those are the two cases, but we're gonna focus on the case where the first derivative is zero as places with horizontal tangents, therefore possible locations for mins and maxes. First derivative of that function is f prime of x is three x squared plus six x minus nine, set that equal to zero. Why do we set the first derivative equal to zero? because that gives us points of horizontal tangency. Then we've got to solve this using algebraic strategies. Step one is to factor out the three, as you can see we've done here, and then factor x squared plus two x minus three. If you have difficulty factoring, of course, the quadratic formula would also work. And then finish this by setting each of those factors equal to zero. So we got our critical values are going to be x equals negative three or x equals one. Now the question is, is it a point like this? that could have a maximum value or a point like this that has a minimum value. And of course, we have another possibility, right? We have some kind of a horizontal tangency. You could have a point of horizontal tangency that is neither. So how do we determine whether a critical value is a minimum or a maximum? What was our strategy? Well, for functions of one variable, we had the first derivative test and we had the second derivative test, but I wanna focus on the second derivative test. So how does this apply in this problem? What is the second derivative here? Looking at the first derivative, f prime of x is 3x squared plus 6x minus 9. The second derivative is going to be 6x plus 6. And then what are we going to do? We're going to plug these critical values into that second derivative to see whether the function is concave up or concave down. Plugging in negative 3, negative 18 plus 6 is negative 12 here. 6 plus 6 is positive 12. Now, negative 12 tells me it's concave down. Positive 12 tells me it's concave up. Now, if it's concave down, what are we going to have? We're going to have a maximum. So the second derivative tells me I've got a max at x equals negative 3. Not necessarily a global max, but a local max. And a min, again, local min at x equals one. Now let's take a graph to see if that indeed is correct. So here's our function, f of x is x cubed plus three x squared minus nine x plus one. The point up here, negative 328 is a local max. Now it gets higher, but in that neighborhood, negative three is the highest value. Notice it's concave down there. And here at one negative four, it's concave up. So indeed a min at one and a max at negative three. So here we have a function of two variables. So this is no longer a curve, this is a surface. Can you think about what that surface is going to look like? What is in the x, z plane? What is in the x, y plane? Well, maybe you can visualize that thing being a hyperbola, uh, excuse me, a paraboloid. Maybe you can also recognize the fact that it'll be at its highest point when x and y are both zero. If x and y are both zero, the z value is one. So let's take a look at our graph and consider how we would find a maximum. So there we go. There's f of x, y is one minus x squared over 10 minus two y squared over five. You'll notice one indeed is the high point. Now we can't talk about a tangent line, but we can talk about a tangent plane. You see that? The plane z equals one is the tangent plane and that is going to be a maximum. Now, how can we create an analogy for our calc one strategy. Well, the rate of change in the x direction is zero. So the partial of f with respect to x is zero. Similarly, the partial of x with respect to y is zero. For any directional derivative, it's going to be zero. So our strategy is gonna to be to create those partial derivatives and set them equal to zero. So our goal will be to set f sub x equal to zero and f sub y equal to zero. That will help us find our critical values. So what is f sub x? 
that would be negative 2x over 10, which is negative x over 5. And f sub y is negative 4y over 5. And setting them equal to 0, what do we get? 0 equals negative x over 5. x equals 0. 0 equals negative 4y over 5 y equals zero. So indeed our critical value, or what I call it a test point, our test point is zero, zero. Now from the graph, we can see that that is going to be a maximum value, right? We see that here at zero, zero, the point zero, zero, one is a maximum value on that surface. Now the question is, right? The question is, how can we prove that with a second derivative sort of thing? So we see that maximum value. We want to prove that with a second derivative, but we don't have something as simple as a second derivative test because functions of two variables, we in essence have four different second derivatives. So let's build all of those. What are they going to be? We have f sub x is negative x over 5. So f sub x, x is negative 1 over 5. We have f sub y is negative 4y over 5. So f sub y, y is negative 4 fifths. But how about f sub x, y? Let's take the partial with respect to y of this. Well, there is no y there. So the partial with respect to y of that is 0. Similarly, f sub y, x taking the partial with respect to x of this thing is zero. And you will recall that in our course, f sub x, y, and f sub y, x will always be the same, which they are here. So I have these four second derivatives. I'm going to use them to construct something called the Hessian matrix. So this Hessian matrix is the set of second derivatives. So plugging in our values from our analysis, f sub x, x was negative one fifth f sub x, y was 0, f sub y, x was 0, and f sub y, y was negative 4 fifths. So this is the matrix we're going to use. Now we're going to create something that I like to call D that will determine whether something is a minimum or a maximum. That is the determinant of the Hessian matrix, which would be what? f x, x times f y, y minus f x, y times f y, x. Of course, we can simplify this because f x, y and f x, y are really the same thing. So we can write it as follows. And this will be used to determine whether we have a minimum or a maximum at our test point. So let's plug in our values here and see what we get. Negative 1 fifth times negative 4 fifths minus 0 squared, which gives me 4 20 fifths. So when D is positive, that enables me to determine whether or not I have a min or a max. So here's our relevant information. If D is positive, there's two possible cases. The first possible case is, and FXX is positive. If that happens, then the result is we have a min at the test point. And the way we remember that is we think of the second derivative test back for functions of one variable. If it's concave up, we have a min. So the second case is if D is positive, but FXX is negative. If that happens, then there is a max at the test point. Again, we go back to our second derivative test in functions of one variable. If the second derivative is negative, we think concave down, and in that situation, we have a max. Now, look at our example here. What do we have? D is positive, and fxx is negative. So what does that tell me? Since d is 4 25ths, which is greater than 0, and fxx is negative 1 fifth, which is less than 0, then the function achieves a local max. Again, concave down is our hint at the test point zero, zero, which we can see on our graph. We see our local max there at the point zero, zero, one. Again, our tangent plane at z equals one. Continuing, our third case is what if d equals zero? 
If D equals zero, then the test is inconclusive, which is exactly what it was with the second derivative test that we did back in functions of one variable. Remember you have a situation like f of x equals x to the fourth, which looks sort of like a parabola. So it's gonna be a min, but the second derivative test is zero there, so that doesn't tell us anything. Or f of x equals x cubed, right? It comes in like this. Again, the second derivative test would give us zero, so that doesn't help us. And then our last case is what happens if d is less than zero? What happens there? The result here is, then the test point is a saddle point. Now, what does that mean? What is a saddle point? Well, let's take a look at an example. So here I have f of x, y equals x squared minus y squared. Do you know what that looks like from previous study? Maybe. Well, if we're gonna find our test point, we've gotta take the partial derivatives and set it equal to zero. So let's quickly do that. F sub x is two x and f sub y is negative two y, setting both of them equal to zero. Then what, what do we get? We get x equals zero and we get y equals zero is my test point. So zero, zero is the test point. Now, is that a minimum or a maximum or a saddle point or is the test inconclusive? What do we need to find? We need to find all of our second derivatives. So let's do that. So fxx is the partial with respect to x of 2x, which would be 2. fxy is the partial with respect to y of 2x, which is 0. fyy, partial with respect to y of negative 2y, which would be negative 2. And fyx, partial of x of negative 2y, which is 0. And typically speaking, our fxy and our fyx will be the same. Now let's construct our Hessian matrix. So this is our format, fxx, fxy, fyx, fyy. Plugging in those numbers, we get 2, 0, 0, negative 2. D is the determinant of h, which is 2 times negative 2 minus 0 times 0, or negative 4. So what does that tell me? If I get a D that's negative? We said previously that if D is less than 0, then the test point is a saddle point. So I conclude that zero, zero, my test point, should be a saddle point. Now, what does that mean? What does that look like? Let's take a look at our graph. So here's the function. I have z equals x squared minus y squared. And here's our usual orientation, right? x coming out at us, y going left to right. So do you see on this parabola, the point zero, zero is perceived to be a minimum, but on this parabola coming this way, if you're climbing it up this way, in that direction, is perceived as a maximum. So again, you can see it looking like a maximum here. And you can see it look, looking like a minimum here. So that's what I mean by a saddle point. It can be either a minimum or a maximum depending on the way you look at it. So frankly, it's neither. That's why we call that thing a saddle point. So can you think of an item you might get at a grocery store that would have a saddle point? Well, let's take a look. The Pringles snack food delivered in the canister with each Pringle being a saddle-shaped curve known as a hyperbolic paraboloid. So you'll notice from this perspective, it's perceived to be a maximum, but coming this way, that point in the middle would be perceived as a minimum. So there's a saddle point, there's a hyperbolic paraboloid from the real world.